The United States of America is the most powerful country in the world, the single remaining superpower that dictates the global agenda. But ironically, the political system of this champion of democracy was built under the guidance of mysterious fraternities and organizations we know little or nothing about. Secret societies have actively participated in the construction of the American governmental system. Freemasonry, to name just one society, left its imprint on the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution, and on dozens of national symbols, from the Great Seal of the US to the Dollar Bill. This American passion for secrets, rituals, and exclusive clubs has been particularly strong in its universities, where the fraternity system was developed. The fraternities, or frats as they're most commonly referred to, are student associations with academic and philanthropic goals. However, they also abound in codes of silence and initiation rites, very similar to those found in Freemasonry and other secret societies. The first ever recorded frats were the Flat Hat Club and the Phi Beta Kappa, both founded at Yale University. Also in Yale, one of the most enigmatic and most notorious fraternities in the world arose, one that has always been favored by the cream of American society. Its name, Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones was founded in 1832. Its original name was the Eulogian Club. Its creator was a merchant named William Huntington Russell, owner of Russell and Company, a transport company which was rumored to smuggle opium into China during the Opium Wars. The name Skull and Bones probably comes from a curious tradition. During their meetings in the campus chapel at Yale, the society used to hang a skull and two crossed shin bones upon the door as a warning that they should not be disturbed. The society was also known as the Order of Death, Cooperation Star, or simply the Order. In 1856, 24 years after its foundation, the order was granted an important plot of land on the university campus and built its official headquarters there. It is a windowless stone construction that can still be seen today. They call it the tomb. The tomb has a dark, labyrinth-like layout that spans three floors and an attic. It compromises a number of halls and secret cabinets chambers with mannequins in full armor, candlesticks, old photos, flags and manuscripts, and a sinister collection of bones, supposedly belonging to historical figures, including the skulls of Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa and the Indian chief Geronimo, and even that of Panamanian dictator General Omar Torrijos. In the keep of the labyrinth, there is a vault with the enigmatic number 322 on the door. Inside, there are just two chairs and a table. This was where the candidates are said to meet Madame, a skeleton that is supposed to be that of Madame Pompadour. Their passion for bones and skulls could be considered in bad, albeit innocent, taste. However, a much more serious accusation hangs over the Brotherhood of Death. It's sympathy for the Nazis. Critics of Skull and Bones insist that the society is not originally American, but rather an offshoot of some German right-wing order. This could well be true. Its founder, William Russell, did indeed live for some time in Germany before attending to his senior year at Yale. And it was actually on returning to the USA that he established the fraternity. Always according to its critics, the number 322 the order's identifying number hides a coded message. The 32 represents the year of its foundation, 1832. And the additional two stands for the fact that it's the second chapter within an international order. Alexandra Robbins, a Yale graduate and author of a book on the subject, stated that the society owns a valuable collection of Nazi objects and memorabilia 
and eats its dinners off Hitler's private silver service. A large part of their liturgy is written in German. Who was the fool? Who was the wise man, beggar or king? Whether poor or rich, all's the same in death. A sizable part of the American military industrial complex of the early 20th century collaborated with the Nazi regime in Germany, contributing immensely to their rise to power. This historical fact is unknown to most people even today. Also unknown is the strong involvement of Bonesmen in the pre-war German-American relations. But history keeps its own records and the past always returns to haunt us. In 1930, Prescott Sheldon Bush father of President George H and grandfather of President George W, a member of the Skull and Bones class of 1917 and president of the Union Banking Corporation, engaged in a number of profitable business deals with Fritz Feissen, the German steel tycoon who supplied Hitler's war machine. The UBC was closed by President Truman during the Second World War under the Trading with the Enemy Act. In other words, for doing business with the Nazis. Apart from Prescott Bush, several other directors of the Union Banking Corporation in New York were also 1917 bonesmen, including E. Roland Harriman and Ellery Sedgwick James. In 1938, Bush, by then executive associate of Brown Brothers Harriman, issued a loan to Hitler's Germany to enable the latter to import American Standard Oil fuel. In 1941, the year the United States entered the war against the Third Reich, Standard Oil, which belonged to Rockefellers, Bonesmen themselves, had six oil tankers sailing under Panamanian flags and manned by German crews. These vessels carried fuel from their American refineries to the Canary Islands, where their German submarines were being refueled. In the meantime, Allied troops were losing their lives on European battlefields. Investigator Anthony Sutton claims that Skull and Bones is not at all an American society, but a branch of a foreign secret society. According to this expert, it is one of the reasons why secrecy in the order is so vital. However, the list of its members is a true who's who of American society. Many of these influential personalities are advocates of the American way of life. Skull and Bones membership certainly has its privileges. At least three American presidents were or are Bonesmen. George W. Bush, his father George H. Bush, and William Taft. The proposition that this small club of the well-to-do pulls the strings of American power and through it those of the whole world by placing its associates in key power positions is supported by substantial evidence. The elections of 2004 saw the almost impossible come true. Both the Republican candidate George W. Bush and his Democrat rival John F. Kerry were members of Skull and Bones. That's to say, prior to running as representatives of parties that supposedly propound opposite political visions. They had both sworn allegiance to the same mysterious principles. And what's worse, they share secrets that are not known to their own constituents. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? The million dollar question for American citizens and the world as a whole is do Bonesmen put their frat fidelity above that of their civic responsibilities? As the BCCI case clearly shows, the answer is undeniably yes. By the end of the 1980s, the scandal concerning the Bank of Commerce and Credit International was making the headlines. The BCCI was accused of laundering drug money and financing terrorist operations. The scandal tarnished the reputation of the US government since the bank operated freely in America 
and was a regular contributor to political campaigns. The administration of bonesman George H. Bush blocked the investigation, which had in any case been entrusted to a Senate commission chaired by bonesman John Kerry. The BCCI was absorbed by more respectable banks and the subject was never revived. Who runs Skull and Bones? Up to what point are Bonesmen able to influence the decisions of fellow members? Perhaps by looking into their initiation rituals, we will be able to have some idea of what kind of power the society holds over its brethren, whether they are industry leaders, intellectuals or politicians, and speculate how they use that power should the need arise. Each year, only 15 students entering their senior year at the University of Yale are admitted. The candidates must have been tapped by those senior classmen of Yale University who make up the current membership. The criterion for selection also includes the candidate's potential to increase the power and prestige of the society. Two votes against the candidate are enough for him to be rejected. During their initiation, candidates must recount all their sexual exploits. Finally, they are expected to perform various oaths, kiss some feet and drink blood. They then have to lie naked in a coffin. And, after masturbating in full view of the others, swear to never reveal their membership of the order. The candidates are then introduced to their future companions, who wear masks for the occasion. Uncle Toby, the Knights, the Small Devil, Don Quixote, and the Pope. The ceremony ends with a grand party that lasts for hours. To imagine presidents of the United States in this situation is highly disturbing. But even more distressing is to realize that the candidate is now subject to blackmail. All the brethren have witnessed the humiliation of the candidate. Each one has spoken of his darkest secrets. Nobody now feels he can break the pact of silence with the order. As of that moment, betrayal is highly unlikely. The government of the world's only superpower is packed with bonesmen. George W. Bush named 11 bonesmen officials in his first government. Add to this various senators, congressmen, and chief justices, directors of the CIA, the Federal Reserve, and directors of banks such as J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. The American media is little different. Among others, Time and Newsweek magazines, in theory competitors, were both founded by bonesmen. The oldest and most influential families also belong to this select club. Bush, Bundy, Harriman, Lord, Phelps, Rockefeller, Taft, Whitney. All of them have undergone the odd ritual of initiation. All have spilled their darkest secrets. All have been ritually humiliated in front of their peers. And all of them owe loyalty to the order. It is estimated that there are some 800 bonesmen alive today, around half of them active and in key positions in the American economy and political establishment. There are plenty of reasons to be shocked just by what we have learned so far. This is a secret society founded by an alleged drug lord that counts among its members people who have financed the Nazis. Their members meet in a bunker supposedly full of stolen skeletons, and among its brethren, we find no less than the president of the most powerful country on earth, and also his main political contender. And Skull and Bones is not the only secret society that appears to be pulling the strings of world power. There are at least two other organizations who are suspected of foul play, ranging from economic manipulation to attempting to achieve world control. They are the Bilderberg Group and the mysterious Council of Foreign Relations.
Skull and Bones has seen its power grow steadily since its foundation in 1832. In spite of its alleged early links to drug trafficking and Nazism, most of its known members are respected, influential politicians and businessmen. But Skull and Bones is not the only secret society whose influence reaches the highest ranks of power. There are more. One of the organizations most suspected of pulling the strings of world power behind the facade of an altruistic organization is the CFR, or Council on Foreign Relations. They are also hidden away here in Washington, D.C., on the seventh floor of this building. They define themselves as a non-partisan resource for information and analysis. That is to say, an innocent think tank. But are they what they say they are? The answer to this question may hold the key to understanding the true origin of many events that happen to us every day and seem to be a result of our own free will. The Council of Foreign Relations was founded during the First World War when a university fraternity presented President Woodrow Wilson with a set of proposals that detailed options to reinforce world democracy when Kaiser Wilhelm II was eventually defeated. The proposals were backed by Colonel Edward Mandel House, advisor to President Wilson. Wilson presented the project to Congress in January 1918, where it was approved. And the CFR was officially founded in 1921. Its first sponsors were members of the most powerful families in the US. Rockefeller, Mellon, Harriman, Schiff, Kuhn, Lowe, and Carnegie. It was also backed by important foreign citizens, including multi-millionaire South African colonizer Sir Cecil Rhodes, and European bankers Warburg and Rothschild. The CFR makes no secret of who their members are or their activities. At least that's how it seems. Its headquarters are on Park Avenue and 68th Street in New York City. Its reports can be freely downloaded from the internet, where the CFR publishes a full web page at www.cfr.org. It runs a newspaper that is the most prestigious political analysis journal in the United States, Foreign Affairs. It seems they have nothing to hide. However, its critics say that it's nothing more than a facade, that the CFR is a dangerous organization set on achieving full global control through the levers of economy and finance. In other words, they're like executives out to privatize world power. According to its critics, the domination strategy of the CFR is to control both sides of conflicts. And its ultimate goal, the creation of a private world government that would run countries as corporations. To achieve this, it would first have to erode the political structures of all sovereign states. Then it would have to foster worldwide socio-cultural standardization. And finally, it would have to impose a globalized financial system that it could control. Critics add that all of this would be achieved by provoking global conflicts that would keep the masses united against real or imaginary common enemies. Any similarity with reality is surely pure coincidence. But can an organization, no matter how hard it tries to manipulate the world, actually achieve this? If so, how much power would it need to amass? To be allowed to join the select 4,200 members the CFR has today, it is mandatory to be American or to be about to obtain American citizenship. The council is loaded with top executives of financial institutions, powerful industry leaders, and mass media executives. Academics and scholars, high-ranking military personnel, politicians, public officers, deans of universities, and research centers are also welcome. Their reports identify threats, opportunities, strengths, and weaknesses, and then offer operational, tactical, and strategic planning in all the spheres of interest to the United States. The question is, is this for the better or worse? The list of its most prominent members is a conspiracy theorist's dream come true. Among CFR's 
most renowned members are David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Hungarian-American billionaire George Soros, Supreme Court Judge Stephen Breyer, Low CBS Network's President Lawrence A. Tisch, former U.S. Secretary of State General Colin Powell, General Electric's former chairman and CEO Jack Welch, current U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, W. Thomas Johnson, President of CNN, and Catherine Graham, President of the Washington Post, Newsweek, International Herald Tribune Group. That's not to mention Alan Welsh Dulles, founding father of the CIA, and a banker, Paul Moritz Warburg, who was born in Germany and emigrated to the United States, where in 1913 he drew up and promoted the legislation that would create the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the American Central Bank, whose capital is not public, as would normally be expected, but is instead in the hands of private banks. The Federal Reserve is not the only institution related to the CFR. The International Monetary Fund behind me and the World Bank close by were both created by CFR members. These three organizations control most of the world's capital, as well as distribution and aid policies. That is to say, they decide who wins and who loses. Both the IMF and the World Bank have come in for some heavy criticism over many years for their lousy management of world crises. When instead of acting like last resort moneylenders, as their mission states, they became involved in dictating the macroeconomic policies of deeply indebted nations, drowning them in more and more debt. This policy had catastrophic results for countries such as Brazil, Argentina, Turkey and Mexico. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate for economics, has repeatedly attacked the performance of the fund, suggesting that it was the true cause of many of the aforementioned crises. This cannot be brushed off as hearsay, since Stiglitz was chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank from 1997 to 2000. In other words, an insider. If we observe how the price of medical supplies generates gigantic profits for those who produce them and at the same time kill millions of people who cannot afford to buy them, if we stop to think about the irreparable damage that multinational corporations carry out in the so-called third world countries, if we study the mechanisms of usurious loans of the world banking system that cyclically provoke crises that sink entire countries below the poverty line, it's worth asking. Is economic war more effective than conventional war when it comes to achieving world power? Are the members of the CFR those responsible for carrying it out? Or is it all nothing but a natural byproduct of the capitalist system? The idea of a world dominated by private corporations, led by the CFR, might sound nonsensical. These corporations have a joint turnover that is almost twice the GDP of the United States and employ more than 25 million people in the United States alone. Their power is surely already strong enough to twist some political arms worldwide. Perhaps the CFR is just an innocent think tank, like its members say it is. One thing is certain, the undeniable and enormous power wielded by such a group of influential people, for better or for worse. What are the secret societies pull the strings? Or better said, what are the societies secretly pull the strings on the world stage? Most experts agree that one of the traits of contemporary secret societies is that they're no longer guided by ideology, but rather by pure and simple economics. In practice, 
This means that they use their influence in the corporate world to force entire countries to serve their interests. The average person is completely unaware of how national strategic decisions are taken. And whatever changes his vote may bring about happen only over the very long term and usually prove to be merely cosmetic. If there's one secret society that has every characteristic needed to raise suspicion, it's the Bilderberg Group. Surely the most exclusive club on the planet and perhaps the organization that really controls the world. The Bilderberg Group is named after the Bilderberg Hotel in Osterbeek, Holland, where it first met. Its founders were Joseph Rettinger, a Polish emigre with social democratic ideas, and Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. The annual meetings that it has held since then have been regarded as true milestones in international politics. For the occasion, each country sends two guests, one of whom is conservative, the other liberal. According to Prince Bernhard, the group was created as an entity destined to fortify the North Atlantic unit, to stop Soviet expansionism, and to promote cooperation and the economic development of the countries of the West. Sometimes to better understand an organization, you need to know more about the people who work for it. There are two interesting facts that question the integrity of the founder of the Bilderberg Group. Firstly, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands was an active member of Hitler's SS in his youth. Second, he had to stop heading the meetings in 1976 after being involved in the Lockheed scandal related to the purchase of fighter jets. On that occasion, Lockheed was found to have bribed Japanese, Dutch and Italian officers. The Nazi background of Prince Bernhard did not stop the Bilderberg Group from being supported by Social Democrats, or by the Rothschild Bank, or the Rockefellers, both of Jewish origin. Other early sponsors included the Wallenbergs, owners of Electrolux and Ericsson in Sweden. All of them still actively participate in the annual general meetings of the group, either directly or through their representatives. The only thing that this confirms is that when it comes to making decisions that will affect the world, ideology doesn't really play that much of a role. After all, business is business. The venue, the agenda, and the participants are not secret. What remains undisclosed, however, are the topics discussed, since the meeting is held behind closed doors, and no detailed reports are published. The conference takes place during a weekend in May, and lasts three full days, usually a few weeks before the G8's annual meeting. A fleet of black limousines drives the guests to a luxury hotel or palace of choice. Security is tight and includes members of the attending country's secret services. Their guests include bankers, top businessmen and media moguls, as well as European and American politicians and leaders. When looking at the meetings, we can get some idea of how the nations of the future will be. Economic power groups, owning both the world's capital and the means for production in an overpopulated planet, sick with poverty and short on natural resources. Past and present participants of the Bilderberg Group include the CEOs of France Telecom, Coca-Cola, Danone, Heineken, J.P. Morgan Chase, high-ranking British, American and European officials and cabinet members, and the editors of newspapers such as El País, La Repubblica, Le Figaro, The New York Times, Die Zeit and The Wall Street Journal, among others. What should we think when meetings like these have among their participants the owners of media giants and still their secret agenda goes unreported? Where does their loyalty lie? With their audience or with this secret society of the rich and powerful? The most popular Bilderberg conspiracy theory states that the group is a test lab for policies and decisions that countries and powerful corporations will later implement. According to this theory, the guests exchange their views on the proposals made by the most powerful countries. Thus, it is possible to predict how these countries will react in real life. 
and fine-tune the ensuing courses of action. In defense of the group, their most recent organizer, Vice Count Etienne d'Avignon, has been clear. I don't think that we are a global ruling class, because I don't think a global ruling class exists, he said. I simply think that it's people who have influence, interested in speaking to other people who have influence. And he added, when people say, this is a secret government of the world, I say that if we were a secret government of the world, we should be bloody ashamed of ourselves. The Bilderberg agenda, according to its own press releases, is the world agenda. Whether its members can then carry it out or not is open to discussion. The items on the Bilderberg agenda vary very little from meeting to meeting. A state of the world analysis, discussions on security in the West, debates on economic and political trends in the developed countries, as well as discussions on nuclear energy and lately biotechnology. Other famous guests at the group's meetings have included Giovanni Agnelli, then president of Italy's Fiat auto giant, and Henry Kissinger. Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, and Angela Merkel attended before assuming public office, as did Kofi Annan, the former secretary general of the UN. Annan was married to Raoul Wallenberg's niece. Wallenberg, as we stated before, is the patriarch of the powerful Swedish family that has supported the group from its very beginning. Other participants have included Henry Ford II, George Pompidou, Helmut Schmidt, and Baron Edmund de Rothschild, together with the father of the American atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer. More names follow. Donald Rumsfeld, Alan Greenspan, George Soros, David Rockefeller, Queen Beatrice of the Netherlands, and US Senator and former presidential candidate, John Kerry. The list, while incomplete, represents the greatest amount of economic and political power ever concentrated in one single organization. Curiously enough, there are no disloyal Bilderbergs. Nobody has broken the silence, and if they do speak out, they do so many years after attending the meetings of the group, by which time it is already too late to change events. For many, these brief statements are proof that the suspicions about the group are staggeringly true. Years after participating in a Bilderberg meeting, George McGee, former United States ambassador to Germany, said that the Treaty of Rome that created the European common market was born in the Bilderberg meetings. Jack Scheinkman, chairman of Amalgamated Bank, and also a Bilderberg member, said in 1996, the idea of a common European currency was discussed a great many years before it came about. We also discussed the possibility of the United States re-establishing diplomatic relations with China before President Nixon actually did it. One naturally wants to dismiss conspiracy theories but it was David Rockefeller himself, a member of Skull and Bones, CFR and the Bilderberg Group, who said something that will be remembered as one of the most brutal confessions ever made. Something must replace governments. And it seems to me that private power is the adequate entity to do it. open to discussion. What is clearly undeniable is that the most powerful people in the world are indeed accustomed to belonging to one secret society or another. Currently there are three societies that seem to have a monopoly on influencing global policy from behind the scenes. Skull and Bones, the Council of Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg Group. According to their critics, they're not different organizations, but the three heads of the same monster that is dead set on dominating the world through control of labor, capital, and land. 
But there is a fourth organization that conspiracy theorists keep bringing up. In contrast to the other three, its activities are public and nothing happens behind closed doors. However, that does not seem to stop the accusations against it. It's known as the Trilateral Commission. In 1973, David Rockefeller, also a member of the CFR, requested that his fellow Bilderberg members include Japanese representatives in the group. But the idea was turned down. He then created the Trilateral Commission, which compromises annual private meetings of some 350 people. Again, top businessmen and corporation executives, media moguls, politicians and non-governmental organizations. But this time, including the Japanese. The idea was to create a trilogue involving Asia, America and Europe. US President Jimmy Carter was present at several of its meetings. But the trilateral is not only criticized by sensationalist authors, one of the most striking accusations came from Barry Goldwater, former Democratic American senator and presidential candidate, who described it in words that would make even the most paranoid person blush. What the trilateral is really up to is the creation of a world economic power, exceeding the political government of the nations involved. As managers and creators of the system, they will govern the world. In the 1980s, it was not the left wing, but the right wing that lashed out at them. The American Legion, the veterans of foreign wars, and the ultra-conservative John Birch Society denounced the Trilateral Commission and wanted Congress to investigate it. But their demands died, buried in red tape. During the 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan attacked Jimmy Carter by saying that there were 19 trilateralists, including Carter himself, in the administration. Reagan pledged that if he were elected president, he would not stop until he had exposed all of the secrets of the Trilateral Commission. But when Reagan finally became president, he included in his government 28 members of the CFR, 10 Bilderbergers, and at least 10 trilateralists. His vice president was none other than trilateralist George H. Bush. At this point, we must face one of the greatest mysteries surrounding secret societies, because the same names appear time and time again. Conservative and liberal, Democrats and Republicans, Nazi sympathizers and social Democrats all seem to live under the same roof in the pursuit of a common goal. Although they seem to have radically opposing views, in reality, they obviously share some of the same interests. The only possible explanation for this is that an establishment actually exists within the establishment. Perhaps that is what President George H. Bush was talking about when after the Gulf War in 1991, he spoke of a new world order. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. There are just too many coincidences to ignore, too many signs that suggest something is terribly wrong. After all, if we ourselves had that much power, money and access to classified information, who could say we would not also use it for our own benefit? If we follow the course of history, since the Industrial Revolution, we will see a fascinating sequence of events unfolding that seem to prove the conspiracy theory, or at least provide major arguments for it. First, the ever-increasing concentration of cash and other resources in a few private hands, such as banks and gigantic multinational corporations. Corporations whose revenues are equivalent to the GDPs of entire countries and whose mere survival demands more and more profits year after year, no matter the social cost. Second, the creation of public multilateral control organizations that are actually nothing but the public arm of powerful private interests. These organizations include the American Federal Reserve, 
the World Bank and the IMF. Third, the undeniable advance of the process known as privatization. That is, taking non-renewable natural resources, communication infrastructures, heavy industries, as well as defense, health and banking systems, out of the hands of the people and delivering them into the clutches of profit-hungry private corporations. Fourth, the phenomenon of cultural and financial globalization that in truth amounts to little more than the imposition of a dominant cultural and economic system upon those of peripheral countries. Fifth, the creation of worldwide conflicts and stereotypical enemies to manipulate public opinion and destroy any possibility of discussion or dissent, leading to the actual loss of many of the most elementary democratic rights. The US Patriot Act of 2001 is a good example of this. When panic attacks, people tend to accept more and more control. Finally, and most interesting of all, that almost all of the key players of these events, those who are really taking the decisions and hold the true political and economic reins of the West by being in command of its capital, armed forces, or even votes, are coincidentally grouped in just a few societies that meet behind closed doors. Are Skull and Bones, the CFR, the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission the cause or the consequence? Does membership mean enjoying certain privileges or is it that only those who enjoy certain privileges can become members? Does it really matter? Just look around and draw your own conclusions. Perhaps it's time to understand that nothing is a coincidence, that events are all interrelated and are always serving a higher power, that though hard to see, is in plain view to us all, if only we know where to look. Otherwise, while believing we are masters of our own destiny, we will be merely puppets in a play controlled by the sinister hands of secret societies. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could save $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Got to watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. <sighs> That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's nineteen ninety nine even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? <laughs> 